indexing is worse than Marxism? Says investment managers. <laughs> so I'm reading a, a man, Larry Swedro, over at Advisor Perspectives. And uh, Larry had written an article uh, a couple days ago about uh, challenging this apparently uh, well-received idea in the investment world that uh, indexing is going to destroy the price mechanism for stocks. And I'm not sure they're talking about bonds, but we'll just do stocks. Worse than even Marxism would have ever done. Now remember, Marxism and socialism are the same thing. I don't care what anybody says. The government controls the means of production. And there is no price mechanism. None. They say we control it. We own it. You don't buy. You produce. And you come here with rations, ration cards, and you get your products for, quote, free, unquote. I mean, it's stupid. People who follow this are just, they're freaking idiotic, man. Socialism is not me using my GI Bill to determine what school to go to. Socialism is not your local fire department. People who say that are just dumb. That's, there's no other way around that. If you believe socialism is your local fire department, you, my friend, are dumb. I'm sorry to say, but that's just, it's just idiotic. All right, so anyway, so real socialism, real socialism has never been tried, Josh. <laughs> anyway, real socialism is the government controls the means of production. It's literally that simple. I don't think anyone would argue that anymore. I mean, maybe they would, but, uh, I haven't, I haven't heard too many arguments about this other than silliness that socialism is your police force. All right, so real socialism, the government says, we control everything, we own everything, and thus you, as part of we, because we are the government, you don't have to buy anything because essentially you already own it. And because you already own it, what we produce is yours, all right? And if you look at socialism, uh, was the uh, quote, Kim Brevis Marx, to each according to his need from each according to his ability. So if you're able to produce more, well, you will get what you need regardless of you're able to produce more. You're just gonna get, if you need three widgets and Joey needs three widgets and you produce six and Joey produce one, you're both gonna get three widgets. And you can see how that breaks down very quickly because like, well, why the hell would I continue to produce six if I'm only getting three. And then you see very quickly, well, why would I not be like Joey and only produce one and sit around picking my nose if I'm gonna get three anyway? And that's what happens in Marxism slash socialism. There is no pricing mechanism. The price point is the inherent way to ration stuff based on people's desires. I have a desire to buy six widgets. I will thus pay more via the price mechanism to buy six widgets. If I only have a desire to buy three widgets, I will not pay said price mechanism to buy six. I will only pay for three. That's it. And if there's only six available, then we're gonna compete via prices to see who gets what. If a guy has a need or desire, I should say, that he's willing to pay 20 bucks per widget and get six widgets. If I'm only willing to pay 15 bucks, then the guy who's willing to pay more wins. This is how price mechanisms work. And this is why socialism and Marxism and communism, never mind the bullets in the back of the head, is forever and always will be a failure. Because you have to determine a price mechanism in order to allocate finite resources. And the finite resources get allocated under entrepreneurism, capitalism, if you will, via the pricing point, what people are willing to pay for what they want and desire. Value, 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 value. All right, so let's keep going down. So how does indexing factor into this? Because with indexing, with everyone, quote, just buying the market, unquote, without ramifications of the current price, doesn't that ruin the price? We don't know what the price of GE stock trades. I think GE stock is up 35% in the last six weeks. Well, apparently under indexing, that would never happen because there'd be no price. Everyone would just be paying for whatever GE stock was and it would never change. Because how do you dictate a price when everything's paid for the same? There's like no, 
mechanism to determine. There's no buyer and seller, according to these fools. They say, well, Josh, if we're just indexing and there's no one basing a price point on GE, i.e. saying G isn't worth 35 bucks a share, it's only worth 17 bucks a share, and the current market is 35 bucks a share, but there's no one to say we're gonna take a short, we're not gonna pay 35 bucks a share, we're just gonna pay whatever it is at the current day, then inherently there's no price mechanism and we're all gonna overpay or underpay. Of course, the first thing you ask is, well, how did 35 bucks per share get set up anyway, guy? With the last available trade from the last active manager? Huh? All right, anyway, so let's, I'll talk about that here in just a second because it's, it's so freaking silly on its face. Indexing is going to ruin the price point. It's going to ruin the market. All right, so let's think about this. Larry made a great point. He said in 1960, there were basically 100 actively managed mutual funds. There were no index funds back then. 100 active managed mutual funds. All right, now everyone else was just a stockbroker, essentially buying and selling stocks as they saw fit. There wasn't a huge active market because the commissions were so expensive. So literally people would buy and sell stocks when they needed to sell to raise funds or to buy if they had excess funds. Now, because the vast majority of us did not have the excess funds in which to buy in the stock market, the stock market was a realm for wealthy people who basically just bought dividend stocks, railroad stocks, conglomerates, whatnot, and sat on the dividends. Huh. Huh, interesting, because back then, with not a huge active management market, there was still a very easy price perspective, even though you only had 100 active funds. You could still quickly ascertain the price. Now, maybe it wasn't as efficient as it is now, because it used to be traded on fractions. It would be 75 and an eighth and it would be the bid, 75 and 3 eighths would be the ask. You know, that's a 50 basis point. Um, or whatever, one half of one percent, whatever it is, 50. If it's 75 and a three eighths and 75 and eighths, that's seven and a quarter, seven and 7.125 versus 7.375. So whatever that is, 25 bits, something like that. That's a pretty significant difference between bid and ask. And I'm hoping I don't slip here because it's kind of slippery. You've already seen me take a tumble once on YouTube. Anyway, but yet somehow, the price mechanism still worked back then, even though there was no, say, even though there was no, um, uh, a huge active management market, if that makes sense. All right. So part two of this, Larry said, you fast forward till nowadays, when the level of indexing assets under management are higher than not only ever, but even higher than active management. So indexing as of you know, now or a year ago or something like that has grown from nothing based in the 1960s to like eight and a half trillion dollars now where active management is only a little bit more than eight. So indexing has actually overtaken active management in terms of assets under management. Yet indexing has grown significantly Ironically, so has an active management too. But be that as may, indexing has grown well above that of active management. All right. So what happens now? Larry's saying so. Even though indexing has grown, I hate to say exponentially, but I'm going to use that just to make a point. Indexing has grown exponentially. The number of active managed mutual funds is now, I think he said, like over 9,100 or something like that. And the number of hedge funds, which again didn't exist back then. It's now over 3,000. All right. So while indexing has grown exponentially, so hasn't the active market as well. All right. And so inherently, the market is more efficient today at determining a price point than any time in history, even though the, the indexing numbers are beating, in terms of total assets under management, the active markets. All right. Now, what if it keeps going all the way where there's no more active market? Now, that'll never happen. Let's just say it did. How would that determine prices? Well, and this is where it's silly that anyone can't see this. I just look at my neighborhood, my house. All right, so my neighbor, cat a corner from me, no one sold or bought a house in my neighborhood for about four years or so. So there is no price point because my neighborhood has been 
literally buy and hold for four years. My neighbor puts a, bit, uh, a sale thing on there. She has an ask, whatever it is, we'll say a million bucks, whatever. She asks for a million bucks. I don't know what it is, but we'll just use that for example. All right. She had a contract 24 hours later. I don't know if it's that asking price. I have no idea. But someone who's going to make the bid, remember buy ask or bid ask, how did that person come up with the bid? Do they just take my neighbor's word for it that the house is worth a million bucks? No, they did comps. But Josh, there are no comps in your local area in my neighborhood because no house is sold for four years. Yeah, they do a five mile radius, comps of similar types of houses, all right? And he said, this is what our expectations are in the fair market value of your home. So she says, and she knew this when she put the ask price out there. It's not like she just pulled it out of her butt. She goes, my ask price is a million bucks based on comps. And the buyer said, well, that seems reasonable to me based on these reasons. Thus, we have a price determination without an active market in my neighborhood. Now, people say, yeah, but Josh, there is an active market outside of your neighborhood, outside the gates. I don't live in a gated community, but just for that outside the gates of your gated realm. Yes, and this is where it's funny. Let's just say it's all indexing funds. There's no more active management. What happens when people need to buy a house? What do they do? They take a mortgage, all right? What else do they do? What happens when people retire? Uh, what do you mean, Josh? How do they fund retirement? 4% rule mean anything, anybody? Now, I don't agree with the 4% rule, as I've said a million times, but just use that for example. What does the 4% rule mean? You're selling shares in which to fund your retirement. Okay, how did those shares get built up in which you use later on to fund your retirement? By buying shares with excess cash. What was the price at that point? Well, the price was what you determined to buy and someone else determined to sell so you could invest and someone else could uh, sell in order to fund their retirement. So even if everything, we're all indexing, everything, there is still a market of tens of millions of people who are trading on a regular basis, and not even trading, but buying and selling, in which to fund their life, to add to their future consumption by deferring spending today and instead of investing it, or selling from future deferrals, now from past deferrals in which to buy uh, fund the retirement. There is still an active market on buying and selling just like it was back in the 1960s. You know, the bid as the spread is what's called. The spread might be a little bit larger because there's less trading. Well, in that case, you say to Schwab, you know, you put your order in, you say, I'm gonna do a limit order. I'm not willing to pay more than 70. 70 and an eighth, or in this case, it'd be 70.125. And Schwab takes out the market, asks a seller who wants to go on a vacation, he's not going to pay you more than 70 and an eighth. What are you willing to take for it? And he's going to say, I am desperate enough to offload some of this for whatever reason, I will take 70 and an eighth. Or he'll say, No, I'm not desperate enough. I want 70 and a half. So there's a quite a big spread there. So if the market or the limit order doesn't get executed you go in there and you put another limit order this is how it is it's an auction man based on negotiating or what you could do is simply say look i just want to go on vacation i'll take whatever i can get that'd be a market order and you know, don't you know try not to do that in a in a very low volume market but people do i mean it's a high volume market you know i don't know microsoft stock the spread is so small it's not worth it to put a limit order in but if it's a low volume market i.e not very many shares of trading hands then it is worth it to put a limit order in because what happens is just like i'm buying that house in my neighborhood you say i will give you this bid nine hundred fifty thousand. she goes that's not what i want i want a million bucks you say it's not worth it to me she goes okay i will wait to find another buyer who will give me a bid that's more to my liking or the seller will say i just want to get the hell out of here because that guy josh is really getting on my nerves i will take your nine hundred fifty thousand bucks or the seller says yeah let's meet in the middle 975. 
that market that market pricing mechanism doesn't go away just because there's a limited market and indexing just because it's an indexing doesn't even mean it's a limited market anyway it just means people aren't paying fees and that's what makes the investment management world freak out when they see their fees being diluted Ooh, ooh, so sad for these guys and again as i said in my post in the community tab the idea investment managers should be, be getting paid literally billions of dollars more than engineers is insane insane but they take all the risk do they take all the risk are you familiar with leverage buyouts are you familiar with private equity you know how this works it's such a scam and it will f fall on all of us at some point and i'm not saying like us specifically but you know this is a house of cars man at some point you need to pay the producers and not the the sharks who are just getting rich off the backs of the producers or the people who are saving but there it is it's not happening today and it probably won't happen in our lifetime there's too much money at stake All right. love to your thoughts we'll see you. look at these guys hey guys i'm gonna drive by the walk by these guys hey guys hey handsomes what are you guys up to huh Hey, hey. Got another pooches. See ya.